morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everybody. If you're watching live stream today, you're more alive than I am. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'm on the downside of a cold. And God willing, we'll get through the service of worship because he's worthy to be praised. And I'm just thankful this is the first day I've really had much of a voice uh, to, to come back. So we're here at uh, Lake Worth, Florida, uh, worshiping the Lord. And it's a beautiful day here in South Florida. And uh, you still have time to get to church somewhere. If not here, to tune into the, our live stream. We'd be glad to, uh, uh, to welcome you to this. And I have to tell you that uh, today is the first day that we have our tree up. And we always like to celebrate that. It's always a, a glorious time. It gets better with every week. This is the first Sunday in Advent. So we're going to light the tree. Uh, or at least I'm going to attempt it. And uh, Philip Warner has... Uh, he's done all of this. So thank you very much. Yeah. Well, let's start out the uh, with uh, our, 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 our wreaths we have that are lit up for us today. And that's very pretty. And if you come next week, we'll light the rest of it. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, here are our... Oh. Oh. To make it really snafu, we go with the light. <laughs> <laughs> a great thing God has called us to be His people. You know, He planned for this before the foundation of the world. He planned for Christmas. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that Jesus is the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, which means that God planned for Him to come into the world to be our Savior. So we rejoice in that. In your bulletin today, there's a call to worship. If you take a look at it, we'll read it together uh, responsibly. And the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for I bring you good news of a great joy, which will come to all people. For to you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, if you will, would you turn in your hip book, please, to number 266, and we'll use just, uh, we'll hold the chorus till. Sing it after the first and then hold it till the fourth. 266. Nice to have five minutes.
please, to number 245, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Hold the chorus till verse 3. 245. song, it's all right, too. <laughs> We're going to hold the chorus until verse 3, and then you're going to really sing it out, all right? I'm so sorry that I can't sing with you. But there is a good voice out here, John. He has a great voice. So, John, you sing loud. All right, here we go. Second verse. Thanksgiving time together with family and friends and loved ones and some are just in memories but we think of those days past and we rejoice to know that you are our Savior and our God and even those who are now with you in your very presence you tell us you're not the God of the dead but of the living so we know that they are alive but just not here in our eyesight bless now we pray thee our service of worship bless all those who have watched us and are watching by live stream we thank you for the congregation here that faithfully comes week after week and supports the work and ministry and the light of this house that it may shine into all the world bless our missionaries wherever they may be bless all those lord who are just flipping through their facebook and suddenly find us may they be attracted to want to watch and want to worship and at, at the very end in order that they might know Christ in a personal and saving way. Bless, we pray, thee, your church, where she's weak, make her strong. 
where she's arrogant, bring her humility. We pray for the persecuted church where your people, in order to be a Christian, suffered great pains and great harm. Uh, God, make us to realize how good we have it here. So bless us in this hour, bless this country, bless the Congress and the cabinet, all those lawfully elected over us, and make us a people worthy of your blessing. Hear our prayer, for we ask it through Christ our Lord, who also taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. There are some announcements, I think, but we'll hold that until you get the chance to greet each other. Don't share any germs. Just stand up and say, good morning, God loves you, so do I. <laughs> Merry Christmas. It's a good time. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Good morning, Patrick. How are you doing? Good to see you, buddy. How are you? one time and my notes slipped off the pulpit down on the floor <laughs> and everybody oh. and I said that's all right I don't need it and so they oh but I did <laughs> but that was a, a, a diversion anyway so we'll get through today we're glad that you're here if you're visiting you know how happy we are to have you we welcome you today uh, this is a grand day the first day of the beginning of the season of Advent or Christmas and it means we're looking for his coming. So what do we do? He's already come. Well, we're looking for his second coming. Amen. He's coming again. Take a look at the announcements in the bulletin today. We have a shoebox stocking ministry. You see that green uh, insert in your bulletin? I hope you'll take one of those. And I hope you'll pick up a box on your way out. Uh, this, they go to the uh, place here in uh, Boynton Beach uh, that has as their residence of retired veterans they're not very wealthy so we're glad to give them a little bit of christmas the boxes are easy to fill and all we ask you to do is when you do that is that you wrap the lid separately from the rest of the box so that when they come here we can add some things to it that we like to do i'll show you what i mean this is the box and the lid it's wrapped separately, that's easy to do. And then the box, then fill it up, bring it in, and we'll put it under the tree on the 18th, December the 18th. And then uh, we'll deliver them that week, and people will think you're wonderful. They always write us a thank you note for doing that. Now also on the 18th, uh, we're going to have a traditional, uh, a, a traditional uh, carol sing-along in here by that time i hope my voice will be strong and i'll be back and we'll lead some of your favorite christmas carols there's so many carols in the book and songs of christmas we do the secular as well but we we can't get them all in the morning services so 
We've always set aside a time when we come together to do that. Now, they've scheduled that for four o'clock. I thought that was a little early, but I think there's something going to go with it. Is there food going to be served here? What's happening? Who knows what's happening on the <laughs> I thought it was five o'clock we were going to have chili, but where's Sally? She's back from Brazil. <laughs> what, what time? Is it four o'clock or five o'clock? It's four o'clock, and we did that because there were uh, enough people concerned about driving in the dark that they didn't need to come. And we want to have it open to as many people as possible. And it's going to be chili? Chili. Chili. Chili to eat, not chili cold. <laughs> so come at four o'clock. Are we eating first? Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. If you say so. <laughs> JR, is today your birthday? Is it RJ or JR? JR, it's your birthday today? Yep. Okay, let us sing happy birthday to JR. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Lord, happy birthday to you. <laughs> and at Christmas Eve, the traditional candlelight service is at 5 o'clock, and uh, we invite you to come for that. And then the next, the next men's breakfast is December the 5th at 8.30. Uh, we have a house, housekeeping notice in there where there are restrooms and, and water for you to be refreshed. Um, and the carols sing along. We talked about December birthdays are coming up. There's a few coming up in November still. Uh, Elizabeth de Barros and Helen Exley has the birthday on the 28th. That's tomorrow. And then Dee Dee has the birthday coming up on the 30th. So we, we want to remember that. If we missed your birthday or we get it all screwed up, let us know. We'll change it. We'll fix it. We want it to be right. Now, I have a notice here from our technician who tells us, if you're watching live stream, there should be a link on your screen that says, click here to visit the website and donate. Click it and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it may be a payout. Who knows? <laughs> You may just start getting all sorts of good things. All right, and then you know, last week we were scammed and they were asking in my name to donate and uh, donate the credit cards or go to the store, buy the cards. Now listen, I, when I ask you for money, you'll know it's more than a credit card. So <laughs> don't, don't fall for anything. And seniors, we were, we're so apt to do that, to listen to that. Also, if you get a call that they're coming to turn off your electricity, because you're, there's some mess up with your bill. Don't listen to that either. Uh, just ignore all of those things. So it's a terrible world that we're living in here, but it was just as bad in Jesus' day, and, and we'll survive it just as the early church did too. Amen. Now, uh, next Sunday morning, I hope to receive new uh, visitors, or <laughs> new members into the congregation. So if you're thinking about being a member and calling this your church home, and calling me and Dr. Wright, your pastors, then just let us know and we'll receive. Here are the questions. You know, you, know, you can't join a, a, a decent club in this town unless you've got a good reputation. Well, that's not the church. You can't join us unless you're a sinner. Is there something about that? <laughs> Only sinners go to heaven. Jesus said he didn't come to call the righteous. So if you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in need of a savior, and Jesus Christ is the Savior, and you put your trust in him, then you qualify as an honored member of this group of sinners going to heaven. No, don't, we don't deserve it, but we're going to go anyway because he paid the price for us. And I'm always glad to explain more about this. Just let us know. But if you want to have this as a roof over your own head and say, that's my church, then just let me know and we'll receive you into the membership of the church. That's next Sunday morning. Continue to pray for our folks. Some of our folks are down with colds. Uh, pray for Dottie Smith and, uh, and Lee and some others. Uh, Wendy is so good about sending out that prayer chain list. That's always very important. We're going to sing another song. And as we sing the song, the one that I had picked out, I don't think I want to do that one. I want to do the one on the back of the bulletin. 
You see it here, Watchman tell us of the night. I want to do that because it's impossible to sing. <laughs> uh, but it's where we are, as we're getting ready. Tell us of the night. Mm -hmm. Erickson, give us the intro. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're here today on the on the eve of, of Thanksgiving that has passed, but on the threshold of Christmas. So we thank you with Thanksgiving for prayers that have been answered, but also for prayers that have not been answered the way we want. Teach us, Lord, to trust you. We're thankful, Lord, for all that you've done for us, for healing, seen and unseen, for the gift of sins forgiven, that we're free for the power to break bad habits. We thank you, Lord, that the storms have blown over us and we've been spared many of the storms of this season. And so in thanksgiving to you, we offer to you our praise and also our gifts, our tithes and our offerings, that there may be in this place provision to do all your holy will, that the preachers in this place may not have to go begging people to support it, but that we will give cheerfully and wondrously will you bless us. Hear our prayer for Christ's sake. Amen.
ways through the wind and the waves and in the sounding of all of nature but now we ask you to speak through this broken voice that we may have something to take home and say it was good for us to be here open your word to us today for jesus sake amen thank you you may be seated the scripture lesson i have been i've been using in the first chapter of the gospel of luke it is filled with wonderful stories. You meet some nice people in that first chapter. You meet Zacharias and you meet Elizabeth. I have to tell you that the first chapter of Luke's gospel, it opens up with this very first sentence. Inasmuch as many as taken in hand in order to set a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. And then he writes this sentence. It's a long sentence. In the Greek, it's only one sentence. In the Greek, it's just one sentence. But the interesting thing is, believe it or not, it is what we call high classical Greek. For instance, do you say tomato or tomato? Some people say, well, it's tomato. <laughs> uh, if you speak the high classical Greek, is it the valet or the valet? Is it a garage? Well, never mind. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Greek has two languages. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that as, as I open the lesson today. And this is just an introduction to Christmas. If you think this is bad, it gets better as I go along through the month. But mm -hmm. one of the wonderful things about this is there are two Greek languages. One was called the classical Greek. It was the Greek of, of the, the great writers, Plato. Uh, but then the other was called the marketplace Greek or the common Greek. And the word for common there was the word koine. And it was the, the, the Greek that everybody in the empire could speak like pidgin English. And they could all talk it so they could use it in the marketplace, in the trade. So Luke writes the first chapter in the highest form of classical Greek. <coughs> But the rest of it he writes in Koine Greek in the common. Why? He's showing the whole world that this is no fly-by-night religion. And he understands what it is to impress the intellectual. But he's really writing for the whole world to appreciate this gospel. And Luke is the only one who uses the word good news, the gospel. He uses it 14 times. He uses it in the book of Acts. He uses it. The other gospel writers, they only use it once. It only occurred one time. So Luke is all enthralled about all this. And so we suspect that here he is, probably the only Gentile to have a part in writing the scriptures. And he's taking full advantage of it. And he wants to share this good news of Jesus Christ. So he's writing to his friend Theophilus about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I told you you meet some nice people in this, but first before you meet those people, I want to tell you, the last book of the Old Testament is the book Malachi. And Malachi ends with these words. Unto you that watch for his appearing shall he arise as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. And then everything closed down. Why, has anybody heard the voice of God? No, we didn't hear him in our generation. How about the next? Did grandparents hear him? Did great grand? No. 
400 years, the voice of God was silent. They only had the scriptures of the Old Testament. It wasn't that God is silent. He's still speaking in the hearts of his people and people are still be believing. But during that time, God was preparing the world for this special event. I told you Christmas was no accident. It was planned by God. Here's what it says in Galatians 4. That God, in the fullness of time, God is a calendar. And on that calendar, every day is marked out. In time, he's in eternity. And in the fullness of time, when the time was right, not a moment too soon, nor a second too late, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman, fulfilling all the prophecies of the Old Testament. So he's preparing the world for the coming of the Messiah, the one who's promised. And there are six things that were important in this period of these 400 years. We call them the 400 silent years. One is the Jews had been in captivity in Babylon and Isaiah the prophet had foretold God will raise up a man named Cyrus. Can you believe this? He called his name 150 years before he actually was born and he's a Persian. God will raise up a man named Cyrus and he will come and set the people free. And so Cyrus was born and when he came and when the scribes showed him his name was in the old Torah, in the scriptures. He gave great liberty to the Jews because he knew that their God was a powerful God who knows the end from the beginning and has planned every day. So the Jews then were ruled by the Persians from 536 to 336 BC. But then came along a young fellow. His name was Alexander. As a matter of fact, if you asked him, Alexander, how are you? He would say, I'm great. And so the name stuck, Alexander the Great. And he went everywhere conquering the world, conquered the whole known world. By the age of 23, he had conquered the whole world. And Alexander the Great had a teacher. Do you, do you remember your teachers in school? Think of a teacher that you had in school. Maybe think of one that you really liked. Then think of one that you didn't like. I, I know you got it right now. Uh, well, Alexander had a teacher that he loved. And that teacher went with him all the way and counseled him. And he said, Alexander, if you're going to be an emperor over the whole world, you've got to unite them in a language. So that teacher's name was Aristotle. Have you ever heard of that fellow, Aristotle? <laughs> he went everywhere teaching the people pigeon Greek the kind of Greek that they could use in the marketplace. That's what the New Testament is written in, and I just told you about that. So the New Testament is written not in the high classical Greek that would only appeal to those who were really true Greeks, but is written in the pidgin English, or the pidgin Greek, so that everybody could read it. And in Jesus' day, they all knew it, because they all shopped in the marketplace. So Alexander went there, and he taught them all how to speak, so he unified the nation with the language. And then there came a, a period of time when Egypt conquered the nation. And during the times of the Egyptians, after the death of Alexander the Great, they held the nation together, but they had rulers until finally the Syrians came along and they conquered it. And you had this horrible king named Antiochus, and he called himself the Great Antiochus Epiphanes, the Great Antiochus. And he hated the Jews. So in order to break up their religion, which was too strong, uh, he all offered a pig on the Jewish altar. As you know, the pig was forbidden. He offered a pig on the Jewish altar. But that didn't sit well with some of the Jews who were really noble people. There was a family called the Hasmoneans, and they were named the Maccabeans. And so they formed a group. All the brothers got together with the father and became known as Judas Maccabeus, and it means the hammer. And they attacked them in guerrilla warfare until finally they won. They actually won. And so you have the days of the Maccabeans. So that you have the whole nation speaking Greek, the whole nation being rid of idolatry. That happened during the time of Nebuchadnezzar when he took them into captivity. Jews were always having idols. They worshiped all the false gods. When they went into Babylon for 70 years, 
that cured them of that. They knew they needed the living and true God. And that now we come to this time of the Maccabeans. So now they're a purified nation. They've developed a group of really patriotic people called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the old time. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. So you have the Pharisees. But then you have another group that came up, but they didn't follow all that. They wanted to be in the world, of the world, but still believing something. So they were called the Sadducees. Now you have these two divisions of parties. So now you have the Maccabeans, and they have conquered uh, the Syrians. And now, sadly, they were not strong enough to withstand the Romans. And when the Romans came in, guess what they did? They had the whole known empire. And how do you rule an empire? Well, you have to have soldiers. Well, how do you get the soldiers to where they need to go? You gotta have transportation. You gotta have good roads. So they built the roads. This is all during the 400 silent years. God is taking the Gentile pagan nations and he's using them and he's molding them to teach them the language, to build the roads, to unify them, to turn the people against evil and against paganism. And now in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Everything was right, everything was ready. And our Lord Jesus came into the world. So now we come to this Luke chapter one and we have the arrival of the Lord Jesus. May I go back just one more time and go back to this and just say, this is the fulfillment of the time. The first gospel that was ever written the first promise is Genesis 3, verse 15. After man sinned and fell into sin and forfeited heaven. And that means he, it's not just that he forfeited an easy life when he dies. He forfeited the familiarity, the loving grasp, the hugs of a heavenly father who created him. He forfeited God. And so God comes into the garden and pronounces this curse. He cursed the, the devil. And he said to the snake, upon thy belly shalt thou crawl all your life and grass shall eat. And he said, I will put enmity, hatred, a division, a sharp line, a barbed wire between you and your seed and the woman in her seed. He will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. Now that happened in Genesis. If you don't believe Genesis, then the rest of the Bible doesn't make sense. And then God chose a man named Abraham through whom he would send this one to do the work of curing us of our ills. So he chooses Abraham. He says, I will bless you. I'll make of you a great nation and you'll be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you. And then from Abraham, he not only has Abraham, but he says now the Messiah will come not just through Abraham, he will come through Isaac. That line, Abraham had sons. But it's going to be through Isaac. And it's not just going to be through Isaac. Isaac had okay? Jacob. It will come through Jacob. And then not just Jacob. Jacob had all these sons, 12 sons. And while he is dying, he has them all around his deathbed. And he tells each one what will the end be like for them and their tribes and their people, their offspring. And he says of Judah, but you, Judah, the ruler's staff shall not depart from Judah. Judah until Shiloh come, the one who brings peace. In other words, he says the royal line will be the line of Judah. And so we find here the genealogy you have like I have. When you come to genealogies in the Bible, you just scan right through it. You go right through it. But they're interesting because Jesus could trace his genealogy all the way back to Adam through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through David, through Jesse, the son or the father of David. And he traces it all the way back. On one occasion when they challenged Jesus, and they said, we know who our father is. Jesus said, I have come in my father's name and you believe not me. In other words, I've come with the credentials and the genealogy to show I am a true Jew. I am truly the son of David and you don't believe me. But one day one will come in his own name without any proof of who he is, and him you will believe. Did you know that when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, next to the temple that was destroyed by Titus, the Roman general, 
there was a building where all the genealogical records were kept. And so when some, uh, somebody was born to be enrolled, uh, they went there and they enrolled that child's name and his family. The Jews had a perfect census of everyone who was born. But in 70 AD, that was destroyed. Jesus could say to his generation, go there and look it up and you'll see who I am. So Matthew gives us the record. Luke gives us the record of the genealogy of Mary and of Joseph. And so we have the record of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have all these things. And not only that, we're not ready to go into Luke's gospel yet for the coming of Christ. We've got to go back to an Old Testament prophet who lived in Babylon. His name was Daniel. And in Daniel, he had such great faith. He believed God. And the Lord visited him in the captivity. He said, Daniel, uh, the Lord loves you. Since the first day you set to have your heart right with God, you have been beloved. Oh, Daniel, man beloved. And then he tells him, from the going forth of the decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, because it was destroyed. Unto the coming of Messiah will be, and he tells him, 70 times seven. That's 490. Well, it wasn't days. Nobody could rebuild a city in days. It was 490 years. And so when the decree went forth to rebuild Jerusalem, unto the coming of Messiah, that's the perfect time when Jesus came into the world. So our Lord Jesus was born actually in about 4 BC. And that coincides with the record we have of when Herod became the king and when Quirinius was governor. So we have that record and can show it. So when we come to this, now we come to Luke's gospel. And here's who we're going to meet. Well, we meet an angel and he's busy. This is a busy time. I don't know what angels do. They're so enthralled in the presence of God. His name is Gabriel. And it means one who derives his strength from God. And so, according to the prophet Isaiah, the Messiah doesn't just come on the scene by himself. He has a forerunner who runs in front of him, who cries, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So the Messiah is going to have a forerunner, and he'll be born first. And so you have the story, you, I think you've all known it, I've preached it many times. I love these sex stories about old people. Uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth were way past age. They were old. And for them, such lovemaking was just precious memories. How they linger, how they ever flood my soul. But Gabriel has a message for Zacharias. Zacharias, the name means God remembers. He didn't think he did. His name said it every time they said, Zacharias, God remembers. And so the Bible tells us in Luke chapter one, I hope you'll take it and read it this week. Luke chapter one, the Bible appears, this, Zacharias is one of 20,000 priests, 20,000. What are your chances of winning the lottery? Did you see somebody won the Powerball? And somebody, you know what, when they won the Powerball, I said to myself, thank God, I still have my dollar. I didn't lose it because I didn't invest in it. I still have it. And everybody else, they lost their dollars, but somebody got the power. Of what they'll do with it, only God knows. But at any rate, uh, Zacharias had no chance, whatever, but they drew lots. It could be either they drew the long straw or the short straw, or they threw the dice, but it was his lot uh, all of his life, he'd never had this chance before. It's his lot to go into the temple and to offer the incense. Now, you know, the pieces of furniture of that tabernacle in the temple were glorious. Each one had a significant part. The first thing was the altar, the brazen altar of judgment, where the, every day there was a sacrifice. A lamb was put on that for the sins of the people. People would bring the lamb. They put their hand on the head of the lamb. They would confess their sins of disobedience and the, the sins that they neglected the things of God. Then the lamb would be given to the priest. The priest would slay the lamb and offer it on that altar. Some of the blood of that lamb was kept and it was to be used inside the holy place, which was a room that was about 40 feet long 
I might be wrong in this, my mind's a little messed up today. Cold medicines. But there was the Holy of Holies. It was 10 by 10, a perfect cube. And inside of that, only once a year could a priest go, it had to be the high priest. And there was the Ark of the Covenant, you've heard of that. But outside of that, in the first part of the room, there were three pieces of furniture. One of them was the bread stain. And every day, 12 loaves of bread were baked and put on there, reminding Israel, God is the bread of life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. On the other side of the room was the candelabra, where the oil was always kept. God is the light of the world. And then just in front of that veil that separated these two rooms was an altar about three feet high and about one foot square, and it had horns on it. That's like my thumb at each corner, a horn on the altar. The blood was put on each tip of that horn of the altar, showing a death had taken place. And then three priests went in there at the same time. The one priest would handle the bread, one the light, one would dust up the incense from yesterday. He would take and he would scrape the ashes. The other would put new ashes, new, new charcoal on the fire that came from the golden, from the altar outside. Some of that fire was brought in. And then the other priest, all he had to do was to place on it the incense and the aroma would come up and that symbolized the prayers of the saints. It symbolized that our prayers are heard because of the blood that was on the altar and the sacrifice had taken place. Hmm. And Zacharias turned. What, a, what an opportunity. Elizabeth is not there, she's at home. Oh, wait till I get home and tell her about this. I've been chosen. So he goes in and when the others had done their part and now it's his turn, they left and he's there by himself all by himself. Sometimes I come into this sanctuary all alone and I say a little prayer. Baruch Hashem Ha'av Yadeh, Baruch Hashem HaMashiach Yeshua, Baruch Hashem HaKodesh Ha'ave. Blessed are you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't expect to see any angels here. If I did, I'd probably faint just like Zechariah. Uh -huh. But the first thing an angel appears, and Zechariah, he's petrified, as we would be. And the angel says to him, don't be afraid. The first thing God has to tell us is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. I've come to give you good news of great joy. Your prayers have been heard. Mm. And Elizabeth will have a son. I move quickly. And he said, it's too late. I'm past the age. We're both past the age. And so the Lord gave him some education on ED and how he could how he could do this. So he went home. They had a good champagne dinner. And they had something nice to eat. And they, they fell in love. But nothing wrong with that. There are no children in here. It's a wonderful thing. And so they fell in love, and sure enough, she conceived. But because he said, how can this thing be? He doubted the voice of God, and I like it. He got Gabriel angry with him. And Gabriel says this, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. See, the Lord just gave him my voice back to say, <laughs> I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God. And because you doubted, because you doubted, you will not speak until what I have said will come to pass. And so he went home. And you know who else we meet here? Mary, the mother of our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now we don't say the next part, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now at the hour of our death, amen. The Roman church does. Jesus prays for us. His prayers are stronger than any other prayers. But we love our Lord's mother. She is blessed among women. And yet Jesus says this, who is my mother and my father? If you believe in me, the same as my mother and my father. 
you stand in the same relationship. I love you just as much as I love Mary. And so we meet Mary in this, and the angel Gabriel, he's switched now from Jerusalem up to a little town named Nazareth. You know, Nazareth is never mentioned in the Bible until it's mentioned here about Jesus of Nazareth. It's not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. Only this one the place when it talks about Jesus of Nazareth. He shall be called a Nazarene. And so the angel Gabriel appears to her and scares her out of her wits. She's a young girl betrothed, engaged to be married. And he says, Hail Mary, the Lord is going to overshadow you. The shadow of God will come, and that which is in you, you will bear forth the Son of God. The Son of God. So we meet Mary in chapter 1. And what does she do? Well, she's been doodling around all of her life writing poetry. She could be hired by Hallmark and write the inside of the cards. <laughs> but she's been doodling. So she writes this wonderful song, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit doth rejoice in God my Savior. And she writes that whole song. And then she goes to see Elizabeth because the angel told her Elizabeth's been pregnant now for several months. So she runs up to see Elizabeth and you know the story. This is a Presbyterian church. We believe that God can regenerate people in the womb. And so when she tells Elizabeth, I'm pregnant, Elizabeth, oh my goodness, the baby just leaped for joy inside my womb. God regenerated John the Baptist inside the womb. Nobody goes to heaven without regeneration. You've got to be regenerate. Are you regenerate? You know if you are, you can know. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you didn't do that on your own. That was God opening your heart to believe. And if you say, I don't believe, then at that point you're not yet regenerate. What must you do? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his ways. The Lord is gracious. There's no bumbling blocks in front of you. There's nothing to hold you back. Why wouldn't somebody come and have an eternal life with everlasting felicity and everlasting joy in heaven and with loved ones? I love this part too. Jesus said, I'm not the God of the dead. My father's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. So where are all of our saints who have been in this church and now they've gone to heaven? They're alive and they're in the presence of God and the family is united in, in heaven. So Mary rejoices and she writes this wonderful poem. The only problem she has now is we meet somebody and God bless him, Joseph, poor Joseph. She comes home and what does he think? He doesn't believe in miracles yet. There was a sign in the Jewish shop when I was there in Israel one time and talked about Israel and it says, if you don't believe in miracles, you're not being realistic. <laughs> That's what Joseph needed to hear. Finally, it took the angel of God to speak to Joseph and say, Joe, it's okay. Marry her, but don't have any lovemaking until this baby's born. Now that's the introduction to our lesson. There are two other people there, Simeon and, 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 and Anna. They're both in there too in this chapter. You can read about them. And it's a wonderful story. What a way to begin Christmas. I pray God will give you a good Christmas that he'll bless you and bring you closer to himself and use you more in his kingdom. That's the thing. When we get to heaven, we don't want to say we got here by the skin of our teeth. And we won't brag or boast, but we'll say, Lord, I'm so glad I had a part in the ministry on earth with mercy ships, with Samaritan's Purse, with a church in Norway, with a church in Lake Worm. Lord, I'm thankful that I was able to invite my neighbor. And who knows how God will use you. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, poorly do we speak of you, but how blessed we are to know you. Should there be one here today unsure of their calling, and if today they were to die, they don't know if they'd be under judgment for sin. May this prayer be a help to them. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve heaven, but I thank you that you freely offer salvation to all who believe. And today, Lord, if never before, I cast my anchor, my anchor of hope. I trust you to be my savior. 
Hear my prayer, O oh God, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We just stand to receive the benediction, after which uh, we'll see because he lives, I can face tomorrow. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, means the smile of his face. It means that God's not angry with you. And may he help you hear his words whisper deep in your soul where only you and God live. Well done, good and faithful servant. I see you struggling in the mist and the mystery of life. Be not afraid. I'm in the mist, and I'm in the mystery. And may God give you his perfect peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.